it's, a, it's, it's to die for. So uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, uh, under the chair seats in front of you, there's paperback Bibles. And pardon? You can use your phone, but you better not sneak on the Internet and look at news or anything, all right? You guys, Dave, look over his shoulder, okay? Keep, keep an eye on him. Jeff, you know, you got to watch the guy. Uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 28. It's page, if you're using a loaner Bible, page 730. If you're not real familiar with uh, the Bible yet, a lot of folks are new to their faith here, and we don't want you to get lost as we uh, page through Scripture. So, uh, how many of you know that there, there is that narratives and stories kind of follow a pattern, a familiar pattern. And uh, it's, it's typically one of two patterns. It's kind of a rags to riches kind of a story. That's the most popular one, right? I mean, that, that's the, the protagonist, the main person uh, is, is on a journey and they, they, they change and they grow and it kind of mostly ends with a happy ending. Uh, this, we're going to read a, a narrative, a story it's a very familiar story. It's, it's about Palm Sunday and Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. But it's a story that follows a different narrative. And I want you to watch, as we read through this, this narrative, how the story starts with just crazy wild celebration. And then it enters into heartbreak and then ends into hope. Okay. So the the narrative goes from celebration to heartbreak to hope again. And it's a narrative that that God speaks to to people in different situations. He speaks to groups of people. And and this story, you have to understand, this story was just not written for us so that we could know, well, it was like a cool thing that happened in Jesus' day. This story carries an invitation because in our lives, oftentimes, we find ourselves in times of real positivity and celebration, and things are going well, and then there's heartbreak. And sometimes the heartbreak just, for many people, is the end of the story. They just, that's where it ends. We're just stuck there. These kinds of stories tell us there, there's always hope, that Jesus wants to give us hope at the end. But, but this story also, as you read it, we're going to read about people who lived 2,000 years ago in a really different culture than ours, and they, they had some customs and things, and they spoke a different language that was really different from us. But they, as you read this story, the people we're reading about, they are us. They are us. And what I want you to see is the reason why this story goes from celebration to heartbreak is because the people don't get it. There's something really big that they don't get and that that God draws out through this story so we can learn from them. Because he wants the story, he wants our story to end in hope. He wants every story to end in hope. That's his will. But for for stories that that go from celebration to heartache, there's a reason that that happens. And we have a role in it. So I want you to pay close attention. So let's start reading in uh, Luke 19. Verse 28, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Oh, excuse me, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. Uh, and, And... in other versions of this in the Gospels, it says they also uh, waved uh, palm branches. So yeah, most of you have palm branches right around you. I just want you to get one. Just wave it for a second, all right? Just 
Some of you are not Palm Branch waving people, but just <laughs> do it for, for us right now. Okay, now hold on to it. I just want you to hold on. This Palm Branch, you think it means something because you've been raised in church, right? I'm going to disabuse you of the notion you've had today. And I'm going to show you what that Palm Branch means. And we're going to use it as, as a tool in getting us from heartbreak to hope. Okay, so just hold on to it. Keep it in your hand, literally. So, uh, when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole, crowd, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they'd seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And these were, these were from Psalms. These were, these were Psalms of, of celebration. Uh, when the king comes in to, uh, when the king comes, when God comes on the scene, this is the kind of things that they shouted. So they were welcoming Jesus as he's coming to town. Now it's a weird scene because Jesus is riding on a, a little donkey. And when kings came into town, they rode on, on big, powerful horses and they had an army behind him. And Jesus' army is a bunch of children who are screaming and poor people and, you know, like kind of the riffraff tended to follow Jesus. And so it's a weird scene, but everyone's really excited. The whole town is coming out because this huge crowd's coming into town. And Jesus is at the, 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 the tip of the spear, so to speak. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Now this is where it shifts from celebration to heartbreak. He wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It's written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him, yet they could not find a way to do it because all the people hung on his words. Let me say something. So when he went to the temple, and you know, you've heard the story of Jesus turning over the money changers' tables and where they were selling uh, the animals. That was in what was called the outer courts, and the the Jewish temple was is on like the highest point in Jerusalem, and it's still there. There's still a place to, called the Temple Mount today in, in ancient that was in ancient Israel where the temple was is now it's got a, a, a Muslim uh, worship place on it when you looked up at that there was an outer court then there was uh, several more courts and then there was the temple itself and the temple was huge it had gold on it and when the sun hit it it just you know you were just caught with awe because it was so beautiful white stones, and it just was a masterpiece of design. Well, the, the largest area of the temple was for, for the Gentiles to come and worship. And that's where all the money changes and everybody did their thing. And there wasn't anything wrong, historians will tell you, there wasn't anything wrong with money changing hands. They weren't, they weren't according to Jewish records in that time, they weren't making an exorbitant kinds of profits on it. They were selling animals uh, uh, to people who had uh, money but didn't bring animals with them on the pilgrimage because you came there to offer sacrifices. And during the Passover, uh, some historians, historians say that there would be over a quarter of a million animals sacrificed during that time because thousands of pilgrims would come, Jewish pilgrims would come to the Passover because the, the sacrificing animal was the way that you, uh, con you continued the covenant that God had started with Abraham. 
And then through Moses, the Mosaic Covenant, and, and, and it was God's way of saying it. All, all covenants were established through the death of an animal. That's what they did in the ancient world. That's how people's relationship with one another was established and then governed. And so when Jesus came in, he, he saw the temple and he saw no place for the Gentiles, the outsiders. And so he went in and, he, and he, he had warned them when he started weeping. He gave them a warning. We'll look at that in a second. And then when he went in there at the temple, he just kind of continued the warning. He turned the money changers' tables over and he drove them all out. Now, after he left, they're all going to come back. He, he understood that. But he was making a point. He said, my house, God's house, is supposed to be a place where all the broken people and all the outsiders and all the marginalized and everybody can be welcome. So, Let's go back for a second and look at the story. I mentioned to you before, and I hope you caught it, how there's this parade and celebration, then all of a sudden Jesus kind of just ruins the party by all of a sudden just starts, he starts weeping. And he tells them why he's weeping. Then he goes into the temple and kind of continues in that vein that this is not good. You think it's good, it's not good but I want it to be good. And so he starts off coming into town on a donkey. And he's coming in as the king that they needed. He's coming in as the king they've been looking for, that all the prophets pointed to, that everybody said. And they'd already seen all the miracles he'd done, the, the, the people he'd forgiven, the lives that he'd changed. And he had, at this point, this is the last week of his life. And if people tell you that Jesus was just about being a good teacher or he's some sort of political prophet and savant, the Gospels are not structured that way. The Gospels are structured to show you that he came to suffer and die in our place for our sins. Each gospel records the, the, the longest, the, the most detailed part of Jesus' life is the last week of his life. And the last week of his life was all about his death and resurrection. And so people who just want to use Jesus as an example for all of us, it's, you know, he's like a political template or philosophical template. They're not getting what he was coming to do and who he was. They're, they're, they don't like the implications of it, and so they try to to, to tell you that's not what it's all about. That's, they're, they're wrong. You can just look at the structure of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are the narratives, the only narratives we have about Jesus' life, and they tell us a different story than what those people are pushing. Okay? Now, Jesus, they celebrated that uh, God had heard their prayers. He'd sent this king and Jesus accepted their celebration up to a point, okay? Because they wanted a different kind of king. Now, take this palm branch again. Hold this up. What that palm branch symbolized in that time was well understood. There had been a, a group of Jewish people who had, who had uh, pushed off Roman rule for a short time earlier. They were called the Maccabees. And when they took over and they defeated the Roman army temporarily, they came into Jerusalem being greeted by a palm branches. And these palm branches became a symbol of a political revolution. They became a symbol of defeating the Romans and throwing off Roman rule. And so Jesus purposefully chose, according to prophecy, to come into town not on a symbol of military political might, a, a huge war horse. He came in on a little donkey to subvert that idea. But the people held out the palm branches because they wanted a warrior king. Jesus was coming as a suffering king. He was not going to win by making other people die. He was going to defeat all their enemies by dying himself. And then he was going to call them to that life of dying to themselves and finding life. Because Jesus said, if you want to hold on to your life, you'll lose it. 
But if you lose your life for my sake, then you'll find it. Now, it, it, it's, it sounds so counterintuitive, but that's the truth. That's the way it works. And so Jesus showed us first that that's the way it works by being willing to do the will of God and be rejected and suffer and die in our place. And he, he was raised from the dead to vindicate who he was and what he was doing, but also to justify us and to transform us. If we put our trust in him, that's how he breaks the power of sin in our lives because we trust that he overcame in our place that, and that he gives us something that we can't generate on our own, okay? It's a, it's a, it's a really wild story. The gospel is, is an amazing story. So they wanted a warrior king like King David, and, and they, they were saying, the son of David, Hosanna, the son of David. And the, the, the word Hosanna meant Lord save us, okay? But they wanted a political victory, political military victory. And so they're waving the branches, and Jesus would have none of it, okay? When he saw them do this, if you read in Matthew and you read in John, and here is the only time it says that Jesus wept when he saw them waving those branches. And he said, you guys don't get it. You don't get it. Just like today in the church, we think we fight over politics like politics are going to solve anything. I've lived a long time. My first vote was back in 1972, 1973. And I'm just telling you, nothing's changed politically. Nothing's changed. It's a mess. And yet we fight and argue and we divide the church. Every pastor I know has seen people leave the church because of political arguments. What, what, a, what a sad, sad state of affairs when the body of Christ is torn in two around politics, right? So Jesus saw what they wanted, and it broke his heart. And so he was not going to be the kind of king they wanted. And when he saw what was going to happen to them when they rejected him in that moment, he said, You've read it. Let me read it again here. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They'll, in other words, they're going to utterly destroy. Rome is going to utterly destroy Jerusalem. That happened 40 years later. Literally, the city of Jerusalem was leveled to the point where there was not one rock. And the whole city was made of stones. It was like someone came in and just like there was a stack of Jenga blocks and just swept it off the table and there wasn't one stone left on top of one another. The Romans burned the stones because you can actually do that. Jesus saw it. And that, now, this is one of the things we have to consider. When we want what we want, whether God wants it or not, it will lead to heartbreak. If we pursue what we want, when we want it, just because we want it, and we, and we, we, we feel validated. Now, let me, let me, parenthetically, do you think it was a bad thing for them to want to be free of Roman rule, the taxation, the occupation, the suppression, the, you know, all the trouble? Was that a bad thing? The answer is no. <laughs> just in case there's no, no trick question. It wasn't wrong for them to want that. But they wanted it more than they wanted Jesus. They, he was what they needed. And that's what happens to us. These palm branches represent what all of us do. I do it and you do it. They did it. This was the most extreme example of it you'll ever find. Because the very people who at this point are saying, Son of David, Hosanna, Hosanna, a week later after he's arrested, and they see he's not going to be the military 
king that they want, the warrior king, they shout, crucify him. Whose will did they want to be done? Their own. This is what we do as people. This is the, this is the universal human malady. And it's hard to humble yourself and say, God's way is better than my way. It's hard to do that sometimes. When Jesus was asking them to trust him and to follow him, even though he was going to be rejected, he was telling his disciples that. They were scratching their heads. If you read the Gospel of Luke and Mark and Matthew, as Jesus gets towards this last week of his life, he begins to tell everybody and tells his disciples, listen, this isn't going to end well. But this is the pattern of life that I'm asking you to embrace where you follow me and you lose your life and then you find it. And I'm going to show you how to do it. And I'm going to give you the grace to do it because what I do is going to be something, if you believe in me, you'll be able to do what I did. I'll give you a new life. I will help you to lay your life down if you trust me. I'll help you walk that walk and not just talk it. And so... This was their reaction, and here's the thing. They wanted freedom from Rome more than they wanted freedom from their sin. This is what we want when we hold on to the palm branch. We want freedom, a certain kind of freedom that suits our desires, but it isn't really what God has. It isn't the kind of freedom that really would give us life. They wanted freedom from Rome more than they wanted freedom from their sin because they would have been happy for Jesus not to die on the cross but to make the Romans die. But that wouldn't have saved them. That wouldn't have solved anything. It doesn't. So in the temple, Jesus underscores his warning and he turns the tables over. Now, I want you to keep your, if you have your Bible with you, I want you to keep a finger in Luke 1 and, and turn right and go to the book of Galatians, just for a second. And this is page 810 to chapter 6. And Paul says something to the, to the church, to the churches in this region of Gal- called Galatia, which is modern-day Turkey, if you didn't know. In verse 7, he says, Don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. We reap what we sow. The one who sows to please their sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to the Spirit, to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Now, what he says is, when you do what you want, if it's not what God wants, it will only end up in heartbreak and pain and trouble. That's the only way it will end. He guarantees that that is the outcome. That's what Jesus, that's why he wept. When he saw that they were clinging to their palm branches and not his will and not the best that God had for them when they were rejecting it, it broke his heart because God's heart is broken when our lives are broken. We aren't always... uh, unhappy when things don't go our way until a certain point when it really gets messed up. And I sat with plenty of people who were in a pickle that they've created. They're the architects of their own misery. And I've just asked them, listen, you need to repent of what you're doing. You, you've gone down a road and you need to realize that road's a dead end and you need to back up and go a different direction. And they go, but I don't really want to do that. I just don't want to be unhappy. And they go, there is no way not to be unhappy if you keep going that way. You have to repent of that. And the sorrow that they feel is the pain that they've caused themselves. That is what Paul says is is worldly sorrow. It's ungodly sorrow. It's not sorrow for the pain I've caused. It's sorrow for the pain I feel. And when we're going to repent, we've got to begin to put things back in order and say, doing God's will has got to become the thing I delight in the most. It has to become the center of my life. Now, that's a journey to get there. But 
if that's your intention, the grace of God will come and begin to change you. It will change you. Grace changes us if we receive it. But you know, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and he said, I want all the broken people to come into my house. He was, if you go back in the Old Testament to the passage that he was citing, he talked about eunuchs and immigrants and outsiders and all these different people who the religious people were excluding because they weren't good enough. And Jesus said, I want all those people to come in, but they have to buy into hope on my terms. We don't get to set the terms of the peace that God gives us. We have to accept the terms he sets. And so he says when the immigrants come in, when the people who are unbelievers or believers in other gods come in, they have to worship according to my covenant. They don't get to just get accepted because they want what I have for them. They have to embrace that I want to, that, that, that our sin, our self-centeredness is the root of our pain, of all of our pain. And Jesus' selflessness is what gives life. And so he asks us, if we buy into a life of selflessness, we will be taken care of. We will be valued. We will find respect. We will find dignity. We will find provision. We will find protection. We'll find everything we need. But we have to lay down our selfishness and embrace the selflessness of Jesus. And it, and it doesn't make sense when you're in a situation where it's two dogs and one bone, right? Two dogs and one bone. You each got an end of the bone and you're just fighting over it. You got to just say, this, this is not a winning battle. We're both losing. Neither of us is satisfied. So Jesus, I choose you. I choose you. I won't play this game anymore. But you won't do that unless you really choose Jesus and you let go of the game. But it's painful to do that. The people saw the king on a donkey. You know what that meant? He was a low-class person. We all want a king who's on the coolest vehicle we can get because that, he's our king. We're his kind of people. That class orientation kind of thinking is, is again, it's just an expression of that selfish world that we live in. Where, does that really matter? What kind of car you drive? Car is just transportation. A house is just covering. Clothes are just covering. They're not some expression of our value and worth, but our society makes them that. Our titles, our money, all these things, they're all going to pass away. You're not taking them with you. I know the, the Egyptian kings and people all over the world have tried to take their riches with them. People just find out where their burial sites are and just rob them. It doesn't go anywhere except into someone else's pocket. And that's how life works. That's why Paul said, if you sow to the flesh, if you sow to selfishness, which we all do, I do, you do, you will find destruction. And Jesus comes along, and in the cross he says, reject that life. I'm doing, and here's the thing, Jesus wept for the people who were holding onto the branches because they wouldn't weep. They wouldn't weep over their brokenness and over their foolishness. And they couldn't see because this is what selfishness does. It blinds us. We can't see of how it's going to destroy us if we keep going that way. And so God comes along in his son in vulnerability. The creator of all things came on a donkey, the symbol of the, a picture of the poorest person that, and the weakest person that you could imagine and says, I'm going to do something that's going to overcome. I'm going to save you from the penalty of your sin, the power of your sin, and one day from the presence of sin itself. All that it's messing up is going to be gone because of what I'm going to do on this cross. So he offered them God's help and hope on God's terms. And the way this applies to us is this. Let's get to that. So we want what we want more than we want Jesus. How many times is that true of your life? I just want you to stop and think for a second. 
It is true of my life more often than I'd like to admit. I want what I want more than I want Jesus. And a lot of times that doesn't even bother me. Do you ever realize that? Sometimes when you, you, you want something that you shouldn't want, and it doesn't even bother us, like, so what? Well, it will bother us at a certain point. And when we're facing the pain, that's, a, that's supposed to, like, like C.S. Lewis says, pain is God's megaphone to arouse a sleeping world. And when, when we're in the pain that's the result of all the choices we made, we're at a fork in the road. We're at a fork in the road. The human, the human instinct is to go self-preservation. I got to get what I want. I got to save myself. I got to wiggle out of this. I got to figure it out. I want to keep doing this. When you're in that fork in the road, you got to stop and you got to go, no. <laughs> if I go down that road, it's just going to get worse. And Jesus has already showed me, you know, where it ends because when he died on the cross, he's saying God will hold us accountable for the choices that we make. We're made in his image. We bear this dignity of, of choice and freedom. We have that. He's conferred that on each of us, but he's going to hold us accountable. Life is full of accountability. Every April 15th, Uncle Sam comes along and says, I want to get a piece of paper from you that gives an account of all the money you made last year and what you owe me. And I know there's people that escape it, but not for very long, right? Right? And they're always in the news at a certain point. These people are just real proud, and all of a sudden they're just humiliated because the law catches up with them. And, that's, and, and it's good. God wouldn't be good if he didn't hold you accountable and me accountable. You get it? He wouldn't be good if he didn't do that. Just like your children. If you just let your kids eat candy and that's it, and you never tried to stop them from doing that, you would not be a good parent. Now, I mean, that's just like a ridiculous analogy, but that's the truth. God is way better than us. So we think salvation gives us what we want. It gives us what we need. And the king comes to us on a regular basis on the donkey. And there's a, there's a little message in our head that says, oh, man. That's just humiliating. You know, that's just humiliating. This, this gospel thing, you know, there's got to be something better than this. There's got to be some option. But this story tells us that the, the king was rejected and suffered and died in our place because we wouldn't say no to what we wanted. He didn't have to do that. He did it for you, and he did it for me. He did it for everybody. Even though we don't deserve it. Jesus should have got off that donkey and said, you guys don't deserve this. I'm going home. You, you, look at how you're treating me. All I've done for you, and, 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 and I know if I keep going into Jerusalem, I know what's going to happen in a few days. He knew that was going to happen, yet he chose that road. And the power of that goodness and like the song that we were singing earlier, pour it out. The waves of forgiveness are coming if we embrace the king on the donkey. They come, they wash over us. This morning I was thinking about this. I just wept. I just said, oh, I, I felt them washing over me in a fresh way. I was singing that song earlier this morning as I saw it on the set. I got my guitar out and I was just playing it and worshiping the Lord. And it just struck me. The, 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 it, it was so, I felt that the, the lyrics were so autobiographical. Oh, the depths of your mercy that saves a wretch like me. And the waves of forgiveness, your blood that covers me, the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross can cover us. And begin to free us from that selfishness. And joy comes with that. And the Lord wants, here's the thing. 
This story ends with Jesus going into the temple and warning the people. But if you, if you read, let me read this passage to you in Matthew. Here's what Matthew says happened also. In, uh, what is it, Matthew 21, it says, uh, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It's written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what the children are saying? He said, yes. From the lips of children and infants, you've ordained praise. And he left and went out of the city. Jesus wants to make the temple, the people of God, a place of hope again. But what turns the temple from a place of robbers, takers, to a place of hope is that we recognize where we're trying to to be the ones who call the shots, where we're trying to have things our way, even, no matter how good intention we might be at that moment, when what we want collides with and clashes with God's word, his truth, and his love in Jesus, we're wrong. We're just wrong. And it may, in the moment, we may not feel like we can accept that, but we have to. We have to die to what we want at that moment and say yes to him. And so what I want to ask you to do today is the Lord's trying to restore to the church because the church in America is a mess. We're a mess. We are. We just are. We're just, we, we just love superstars. We love money. We love pleasure. We love to be entertained. We love to be distracted. And it's, it's, we're like them. Do you understand we're singing, Jesus, 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 give us money, give us pleasure, give us comfort, give us health. That's what's being preached all the time, and, there, and the cross isn't at the center of that. Jesus will bring those things. He will take care of us. But we've made those things more important than him. We have. And so the only way that we rectify that, the only way, the, Lord's, the Lord is here. The Lord is, it never leaves his church and his people. He doesn't. He never leaves us. But if, if we don't recognize he's the king who rides on a donkey and we embrace that king, we don't get what he has for us. As much, and he stands there and goes, here I am. Embrace me. And we hold on to the palm branches and we go, no, we're waiting for this king. We're waiting for this one. This is who we want. And so... This restoration is going to come through repentance. It's going to come through repentance. It's going to come with us saying, I will not be the one who calls the shots, but with God's help, I'm going to embrace the selfless life of Jesus. I'm going to, I'm going to embrace it. I'm going, to, I'm going to walk it out where I live and work and learn and play with God's help. So we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And if guys in the worship team, if you could come back up. What I want to ask you to do is, as they're coming up, we're just going to take a couple of minutes of silence. And what I want you to do is ask the Lord this. And he will show you if, if your heart's open. He will show you if you'll open your heart up and you'll say, Lord, not my will, but your will. Is there anything in your life right now where... You want it more than you want him. Is there anything that, that you're really focused on right now? It might be a good thing. You know, it might be finishing your education. might be the next step in your career. might be, you know, get, having a family. might be, you know, getting married, having kids. might be traveling. might be whatever. Or is it in any way more important to you than Jesus. Sports, entertainment. You can tell. You can tell. If you wonder what's really important to you, look at your checkbook. 
Seriously, look at your checkbook. Look at how you spend your time and your money and your energy. The, the people who had the little donkey, when, when the people said the Lord needs it, they said, great. But there's a lot of, of us at a given moment would just say, no, you can't have that donkey, Jesus. So is there a donkey in your life? And what I want you to do is, if you recognize one, it could be your own personal standing. That is your palm branch. For them, it was we want Rome's foot off our neck more than we want Jesus. 